commercial, land, employment, um, Sharia divorces. We have a Sharia Qadi in the office. Inheritance, child maintenance, and things like that. We do not handle probate or administration of estates of deceased persons. The ADR Act specifies um, three types of mechanisms to use in dispute resolution. That is uh, mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. The presentations were reinforced by Sanad Dahaba, Executive Secretary, National Agency for Legal Aid. He said under the Legal Aid Act of November 2008, access to justice is guaranteed to all, particularly the poor and vulnerable members of the society who cannot afford the services of a lawyer. This, he believes, is envisaged to decongest courts and prisons in the country with the end result leading to justice for all, a foundation for national stability and socio-economic advancement. The forum was also characterized by a group works by the participants. Farmer Fofana, GRCS. From there we take our first break, the news continues right after. 3G internet service at the lowest price ever. 3G AfriCell brings you the most affordable 3G internet bundles ever. 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 Get your AfriCell Extreme 3G internet service for as low as $15 only. AfriCell 3G bundles starting from 50 megabytes up to 12 gigabytes. 12 gigabytes bundle for a tariff as low as 5 budgets. Megabytes. And all bundles are valid for 30 days. Afrocell Extreme 3G service for as low as $15. To subscribe, please dial 120 and choose from the available 3G bundles. For more info, call 113. Afrocell Extreme 3G service. For as low as 5 bundles per megabyte, stay connected to Afrocell's 3G network. Afrocell. When we say Extreme 3G, it is truly extreme. Welcome back. At least 2,600,000 Sierra Leonean voters have been out to take part in another election to choose a new president. Campaigning for the polls have been largely peaceful. The contest is between incumbent Ernest Pai Koroma and former junta leader Julius Mada Bayo. We have details of that story in this report. There were long lines outside polling stations early Saturday morning in Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone. Ten years after the end of a long and bloody civil war, voter enthusiasm was striking for these high-stakes general elections. 2.6 million Sierra Leoneans were asked to cast their ballots. The elections will be a test of the West African nation's post-war recovery. Despite a lucrative mining boom, Sierra Leone remains an extremely poor country with sharp inequalities. So I need changes. School fees are very hard. Things to eat is very hard. Clothes to wear are very hard. You know, everything I've been getting very hard in this country. So we need changes. Despite ethnic divisions, which are reflected in the political landscape, the election campaign went smoothly. A peaceful election process from casting ballots to the announcement of the results would be an important step towards the consolidation of democracy. When the results came out, everybody should happy. Yeah, if you yeah. win, okay. If you not win, you, you keep, you, you relax and wait till 2017. Elected in 2007, President Ernest Koroma is running for re-election. He's seen as favorite to win. His main challenger is ex-military leader Julius Mada Bio, who has a somewhat murky past as a coup leader who briefly held power some 15 years ago. Israel is today stepping up its airstrikes in Gaza, hitting targets across the Palestinian territory. An Israeli Defense Force convoys are carrying tens of thousands of soldiers across the Gaza border. It's all fueling fears of a possible Israel crown invasion. We have details in this report. A ceasefire are intensifying. More than 800 bombs fell on the Gaza Strip, causing more than 40 deaths and hundreds of injured. On the other side, Palestinian militants launched more than 300 rockets, many of them intercepted by Israel's anti-missile defense shield. In the Palestinian enclave, Israeli strikes knocked out the power system. The office of Prime Minister Ismail Haniya was badly damaged. Palestinians in the West Bank demonstrated against the Israeli attacks. People are being killed and we have to wait three days for Arab countries to have a meeting. 
We want more than talks. We want something realistic on the ground. Tunisian Foreign Minister Rafik Abdeslam visited Gaza. His appearance in the Palestinian territory followed that of his Egyptian counterpart Hisham Kandil Friday. He called on the UN and Arab League to intervene. What Israel is doing is unacceptable and illegal. Israel should recognize that a lot of things have changed. A lot of water has passed under the Arab bridge. In Israel, a huge mobilization effort is underway as Air Force jets continue their onslaught against Gaza. Thousands of reservists are being called up. Tanks are being massed along the border amid fears a land invasion could be imminent. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is appealing for the escalation to stop. The Secretary General has continued to speak with international and regional leaders and officials by telephone and in person as part of his efforts to call for restraint and push for an end to violence. As part of those efforts, he plans to visit the region shortly. Israeli sources suggest the offensive will continue until the Palestinians end the rocket attacks. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held a meeting of the war cabinet, but decisions were kept secret. On the Palestinian side, messages of defiance continue to be made. The death toll continues to surge in Syria. Opposition activists say five people have been killed so far today. 122 were killed Friday. Fighting has quietened down along Syria's border with Turkey, where rebels have made significant gains. CNN's Ivan Watson made it to the border town of Brazilin, where rebels took control. Up until a week ago, this was one of the headquarters of one of the wings of Syrian intelligence. And you can see that the sandbags are still here. The signs that used to show portraits of Bashar al-Assad are gone, destroyed now and the building has very much been torched. This rebel that I've been talking to, this man right now, says he captured this gun from the commander of this base. As for the commander, he's dead now. The shopkeepers here are packing up and moving out. As you can see, here in the main bazaar of Ras Al Ain, a week after the fighting began, it's completely shuttered and closed, except for the stalls that have had their uh, had their shutters blown open by the fighting that's taken place here. Now, some of the shopkeepers we've talked to, they say they're happy that the government forces are gone and that the rebels have come here, but they clearly don't trust the situation enough because just 48 hours ago, Syrian government warplanes were bombing this very town. This was pretty much ground zero for the battle that took place for Ras al You see the, the destroyed military vehicle and just the extent of the damage here. The rebels have been describing how they mounted their ground assault on what was, looks like it was the administrative center of this border town. And after that fighting, that's when the government airstrikes began, which probably added uh, to the damage and the destruction that we're seeing here. The residents that we're seeing, the few that walk around, and here is a gentleman showing his respect or lack of for the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad. Residents that we've talked to say they are not bringing their families back because they're still nervous that there could be more airstrikes, more government attacks on this battlefield city. The rebels have been taking us to a Christian school that was narrowly missed by an enormous airstrike. Uh, from what they say was a Syrian government MiG fighter jet. And that gets to another point of tension here in Ras Al Ain. This is not a homogeneous town. There were Christians living here as well as ethnic Kurds. And some of these groups, some of their political parties have spoken out saying that not only does the Syrian government have to evacuate Ras Al Ain, which they've effectively done, chased out by the rebels, but they've also warned the rebels that they too must leave. And that is a warning that the rebels refuse to heed. I've been watching CNN, Russell Line on the Syrian border. And before we end this edition of the news, a recap of our top stories. The vice president of the Gambia and her Bangladeshi counterpart have presided over the laying of the foundation stone of the Population Partners in Development Secretariat in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Organizers of this year's NACON have held talks with the vice president, Ajadokra Esadinjai Saidi, as preparations for the Janjambra Yurkam Vajan's Skada Peace. 
मोर्न टू 